Okay, recently the House of Representatives passed this bill that, if it becomes law, could lead to a ban of TikTok. I don't know if either of you guys have ever been on TikTok, but it's very addictive. So if you were to ask Congress to ban an app that has been sucking your time just to help you out with living your life, what app would you want Congress to ban? I would not ban a specific app. But I would ban the thing that tells me every week on Sunday how much time I have spent on my phone. (laughs) You know, um, I don't really glance at it. I see it. I ignore it. I I love it. Glenn doesn't need government overreach to control his feelings about how he uses his time. Sorry, Aaron. I'm Elahe Azadi. It is Friday, March 22nd, and this is The Campaign Moment, a new segment we are doing every Friday here on Post Reports to talk about all things politics. And every week, you'll be hearing from senior political reporter Aaron Blake. Hello, Aaron. Hey, good to be here again. And today, we also have with us Glenn Kessler, who runs the fact checker for The Post as its chief writer and editor. Hello, Glenn. Glad to be with you. Glenn, how would you explain what the fact checker is? The fact checker, it's mostly to help readers understand difficult policy choices that politicians have to make. And we do this by taking a detailed look at statements they make and whether or not they are true or false. Mm -hmm. Politicians are basically like used car salesmen. They're going to try to sell you a policy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like any used car, you want to look under the hood and see whether or not they're saying – what they're saying about it is truth. Yeah. And so at its heart, I see the fact checker as really about demystifying policy, foreign policy, domestic policy, healthcare policy, tax policy. Uh, But we get to do it in a fun and interesting way because we're taking – statements made by politicians and putting them under the microscope. Yeah, you're looking under the hood, and yeah. I wish I could bring you to a used car lot to also look <laughs> under the hood of a car. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know much about cars. Glenn Kessler is the car facts of political journalism. That's, that's the way I would think of Glenn. Now. That's, I like that description. Yeah, you should, you should use that, Glenn, in <laughs> your bio. So we're going to talk about some big things that happened this week in the campaign, what's going on with the Trump campaign, the impeachment inquiry into President Biden. But also, I know, Aaron, your big campaign moment was the Ohio Senate race. It was a primary, and I want to start there. Aaron, can you explain the dynamic at play here? Because this is a situation where Democrats spent millions of dollars in Ohio to support the Republican Senate candidate, Bernie Marino, and he won. And Aaron, can you just explain this dynamic of why Democrats would be spending all this money to support a candidate who is very far from from where their politics are? You know, we just had the presidential race solidified. And I think the timing of this primary was appropriate because this was a big one. This is one of Democrats' toughest seats to hold, one of Republicans' biggest pickup opportunities. It's very much a seat that could determine who has control of the Senate after the 2024 elections. And the winner of the Republican primary was very consequential. Democrats and Trump joined in this one in wanting Bernie Marino to be that nominee. They both, you know, campaigned for him in Trump's case and spent money for him in Democrats' case. And so it's a really interesting dynamic where those two sides were kind of joined in wanting a certain candidate. And now we have that candidate. And I think the big question here is, you know, is that candidate actually going to hurt Republicans in the general election like we've seen with so many candidates before? A lot of candidates in 2022 in the Senate, you know, going back further a decade ago, this was a big problem for Republicans in some key Senate races. And so Democrats have really gambled on the idea that this seat just became a lot more easy to hold for them. And that could really have big consequences. I mean, this is also the second time in just recent weeks that I've noticed a situation like this in the primary season. The other one I'm thinking about is in California. And Glenn, I don't know if you have a sense of how often or normal some a situation like this is where, at least in California, you had a Democrat, Adam Schiff, and he made this campaign ad that indirectly but also very intentionally elevated the Republican candidate, Steve Garvey's profile, Is something like this normal where you're basically trying to get someone who you're less aligned with to be your opponent? Well, it's done on occasion. 
and Democrats have done this in other primary races. California is somewhat unusual because that's a jungle primary mm. where it's the top two vote getters end up going to the general. And many times in California, that means two Democrats. Right. So Adam Schiff would have had a much tougher time running against Katie Porter head to head. as She was the progressive Democrat. So he did try to elevate Garvey just – and Garvey managed to get in and Adam Schiff by all accounts will now win 60, 65 percent of the vote against a very weak Republican candidate. The situation in Ohio was a little different where they were actually intervening in a Republican primary that involved re just Republicans, not right. this kind of jungle primary situation. I wonder if like the philosophical implications of this because in some ways if you're just looking at it from a strategic perspective, point of view, oh, this candidate would be easier to beat in in California, right? Right. The risk is that conservative candidate will win and then you have elevated someone who Democrats claim they are against. They're against election deniers and that sort of thing. So they've elevated someone. And so in terms of you know long-term governing, it might really not be the best strategy, though for short-term politics, as long as you keep winning, it's something that probably Democrats will keep doing. Yeah, and this is something that has proven controversial even in Democratic circles. They've had a lot of success with this, dating back to Claire McCaskill, the Missouri senator who kind of mainstreamed this approach in the 2012 election by elevating Congressman Todd Akin. People might remember the whole, quote, legitimate rape controversy there. She she got him through the primary and then defeated him pretty handily. In the 2022 election, this worked out very well for Democrats. They tried to elevate about a dozen Republican candidates who were more extreme. Six of them wound up making it through to the general election, and all of them lost. I think Ohio really drives home how this can backfire, though, because Ohio is a red-leaning state. Bernie Marino has a very good shot of winning the election. He may not have as good a shot as other Republicans would have. But the danger is that Democrats, by playing in the Republican primary, might have kind of greased the skids for somebody who is an election denier, who has called January 6th defendants political prisoners, to actually be in office one day. And so that's why a lot of even uh, Democrats are, are pretty uncomfortable with this strategy because it is so central to their brand right now that those kinds of views are just beyond the mainstream and that, that they undermine democracy. Yeah, and that they're dangerous. So it does seem to and undermine that, dangerous, yeah. that, that point of view. Okay, so I want to go from there to the Donald Trump campaign because actually Trump was in Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, on Saturday stumping for Marino. And he made this comment where he used the word bloodbath when describing what would happen if he loses the election. So let's quickly listen to what he said. We're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those guys if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. But they're not going to sell those cars. They're building massive factories. A friend of mine. Glenn, this is in your wheelhouse. When you hear those comments, how do you approach them as a fact checker? Oh, well, that's an interesting question because the the. Uh, Biden Harris campaign immediately cut out, you know, a, an ad or a tweet saying Trump is claiming that if he's elected, not elected, that it'll be a bloodbath. And as you could hear from the tape, in context, Trump is saying that what he wants to do is impose a huge tariff on Chinese electric vehicles. And if he's not elected and unable to do that, then, you know, there would be a bloodbath, essentially an economic bloodbath. He, so, like, sandwiched it in between these other comments. Right, exactly. And, the, you know, from a policy point of view, Biden is actually considering imposing a really large tariff on Chinese vehicles himself. So, hmm. it's you know, it's wrong for Trump to say or suggest that Biden wouldn't do what Trump wants to do. He's not going to do as extreme as what Trump is talking about. But he's still very – Biden is equally concerned about the threat posed by Chinese electric vehicles. But at the same time, Trump has this habit – of slipping in phrases and things like like bloodbath to catch attention and to indicate violence, so he can have his cake and eat it too. He mm. can he can put it into the bloodstream. Everyone talks about it and writes about it, and then he can say, "I'm outraged 
that the Biden people would misinterpret yeah. what I said. Well, what's crazy is I have heard this comment and it's been in my feed all week, but I didn't really know this element of actually President Biden is wanting to do something similar. Like that whole part of it became out of the equation. And yeah, everyone is talking about the blood path comment. Aaron, I don't know what how when you heard it, is this just in line with how his approach is politically on the campaign trail? Yeah, yeah, just like Glenn said, like it's obviously very intentional. It is saying something and then you know, having people interpret it very logically and then, you know, crying foul that they're taking him out of context. I think it's important to note, you know, the big thing was like, is he pointing to violence here? And I would argue that what he said in this case was not as direct as what he has said in the past. But there are multiple instances of Trump talking about, you know, the ideas that he would be wronged and that there would be violence in response. In 2016, he said that if he were denied the presidential nomination at the Republican convention, quote, I think you'd have riots. In 2020, when there was an adverse court ruling in Pennsylvania, he suggested that it would induce, quote, induce violence in the streets. When he was, you know, about to be charged by the Manhattan district attorney last year, he warned of, quote, potential death and destruction. So there are a lot of very, very much more direct examples of Trump talking in much more explicitly violent terms about what would happen if he feels like he is wronged. And so I think to focus on the bloodbath one kind of misses the point in some ways, but you need to put it in that larger context of all these times that he has very directly alluded to the idea of of violence happening if something goes wrong, according to him. The other really fascinating thing that happened with the Trump campaign this week was reporting that we had that Trump is preparing to bring back Paul Manafort as his campaign advisor. So... Aaron, can you just remind us who Manafort is and and why this is making headlines? I mean, this is a name that if you go back into the deep recesses of 2016, maybe you remember, but just refresh our memory here and why this matters right now. Yeah, I will say when I was writing this piece that I wrote on this uh, this week, I was going over all the coverage of the Rust investigation, and there were so many names that I knew once upon a time and had kind <laughs> of forgotten about. Paul Manafort was a high-ranking member of Trump's campaign in 2016, actually for a pretty brief period of time, it turned out. But the big significance here is that Paul Manafort is somebody who, according to not just the Mueller report, but also a bipartisan Senate report that was released in 2020, had ties to somebody who was tied in with Russian intelligence. This bipartisan Senate report labels this person, Konstantin Kalimnik, as a, quote, Russian intelligence officer, basically a spy. And so this raises the possibility that Trump would be bringing back into his campaign fold somebody who essentially served as a conduit between Russian influence and the Trump campaign. And the other thing that I think is really important here is that, number one, that this was a bipartisan report. This was not Mueller. This was a committee that was headed by Marco Rubio that put out this report. And the other thing is that that report alluded to the fact that we just don't know the true extent of the ties between Russia and the Trump campaign because the most direct tie is Paul Manafort and this Konstantin Kalimnik. And Paul Manafort essentially lied about so much of these things. And so we don't have a true window into how much, quote unquote, collusion there was between the two sides. So the idea that this would be somebody who would be brought back into the fold, I think, is a pretty, you know, it'd be one of the most shocking campaign hires in recent memory, certainly. And so, Glenn, why would Trump bring someone like Paul Manafort back in, given he was part of the whole beginning of these allegations about Russia colluding. Well, you know, you have to remember that Paul Manafort proved his loyalty to Trump. He cut a plea deal, but then he was charged for lying as a result of his plea deal. And then Trump pardoned him. And I think Trump enjoys sticking everyone's nose in it. It's a provocative act. And only people like Aaron and I are actually going to care that he was once maybe, a, you know, had ties to Russian intelligence. For most ordinary Americans that are deciding whether to cast their votes, it's part of the noise that accompanies Donald yeah, Trump. Yeah, maybe not registering. I mean, we can contrast that bringing up the question of loyalty to former Vice President Mike Pence, who announced on Fox News last week that he would not be endorsing Trump in the campaign. So let's listen to how he explained that. As I have watched his candidacy unfold, I've seen him walking away uh, from uh, our commitment to uh, confronting the national debt, 
I've seen him uh, starting to, to shy away from a, a commitment to the sanctity of human life. And this last week is his reversal uh, on, on getting tough on China. So the interesting thing for me about this, it is pretty astonishing that someone who served for four years as vice president would not endorse the president. Who again, he served, who yeah. Who he served. But of course, it's also unusual for a former president to be running for president. So pick your president. I saw a statistic which was really amazing because this was on Fox News. So mm-hmm. Fox News got this scoop. You know, the vice president was not going to endorse Donald Trump. It's a big scoop. Big scoop. Over the next four days, the amount of time that CNN and MSNBC devoted to this announcement by Pence was more than an hour and a half each. Mm -hmm. Fox News devoted four minutes. Oh, wow. In total. In total. Like they had this scoop, but they didn't really want to let their viewers know that the vice president had dissed the president. And I think it's important to note, like, there were some people that were treating this as, you know, of course, Mike Pence isn't going to endorse Trump. Like, it, like, it wasn't very surprising at all. Yeah, because you know, he, again, because of what happened with January 6th, right? They haven't exactly. been on exactly friendly terms since then because Pence didn't do what Donald Trump wanted him to do that day. Right. But also, in addition to this being Trump's vice president and somebody who served rather obsequiously in that role— This is somebody who stood on a Republican debate stage in August and raised his hand when he was asked if he would support even a convicted Donald Trump if he were the Republican Party nominee. So it wasn't a cinch that Mike Pence was going to do this. And in fact, we've seen a lot of Republicans who very clearly wanted to move in a different direction from Trump come around and endorse him after Trump effectively secured the nomination. These would be the Mitch McConnells, the John Thunes, Chris Sununu, Brian Kemp. You know, basically all these Republicans came forward and said, you know, he's the nominee now. The alternative is Biden, and he is better than Biden. Um, Pence has gone a very different direction, and I think that's significant. So why then? Why would he go in a different direction? It's a really good question. You know, certainly the fact that Trump was attacking Mike Pence even um, amid the uh, unrest at the Capitol and has kind of turned him into a a boogeyman for the MAGA movement, that's got to play in here at least somewhat. I mean, Mike Pence is only human. Maybe he doesn't think that he has a political future and he can speak a little bit more freely about these things now. That's certainly a trend that we see in a lot of Republicans who come out uh, more strongly against Donald Trump. But, you know, I think what's also interesting here is that the way that Mike Pence talked about it wasn't just January 6th was an abomination or, you know, I have hard feelings about that. It was that Donald Trump is not that conservative, and I can't support somebody who's not conservative because I'm a conservative. And it's going to be really interesting to see if others might latch onto that justification. And in fact, we've already seen one person do that. It's Todd Young, a senator from Indiana, who's not exactly a Susan Collins or a Lisa Murkowski, some of these moderate Republicans in the Senate. The pretty conservative Republican senator who after Pence said this, said also, I am not going to be endorsing Donald Trump in this election cycle. And so I think this at least provided something of a permission structure for people like Todd Young to hold out and and make a pretty significant statement in their own right. Yeah, I'm not sure I really believe the claim that he's not really a conservative or he's not conservative enough for me. I viewed that as kind of a convenient excuse. Yeah. But he didn't want to come out and actually say, you know, having observed Trump up close, that that man is not really qualified or should not be president again. He's not willing to go as far as Liz Cheney or someone like that. So this was kind of like the fig leaf that he gave. I mean, mm. I think that Glenn's right about this, too. And that the, the reason is that once you say this is about January 6th, you basically write off your criticism with a large portion of the Republican Party. If you say this is about Trump's first term, you also write off a very significant portion of the Republican Party. So he's basically giving them an argument that potentially some of them could latch on to. I don't think a lot of them will, but it's something that's at least more feasible for a lot of Republicans to say, you know, that they maybe kind of uh, align with that criticism in certain ways. Well, there's so much more to talk about, but let's take a pause here. And after the break, we're going to get into the impeachment inquiry into President Biden.
So now I want to turn to this hearing that happened this week in the GOP-led impeachment inquiry against President Biden. For those who don't remember, this has to do with allegations that the president and his family capitalized on the Biden family name financially, and that this amounts to high crimes and misdemeanors. And they had witnesses coming, and they reiterated what are some pretty thin allegations. And House Republicans have not yet turned up any evidence or testimony showing that Joe Biden directly participated in or benefited from his son Hunter Biden's business dealings. So I guess my first question is, why is this still happening? <laughs> well, it's because the Republicans promised that they would impeach Joe Biden. And Fox News in particular has been flogging this on a, on a regular basis. Sean Hannity, the popular Fox News host, has had uh, members of the committee that have been doing this inquiry on, on a weekly basis. And so there's been an expectation Biden was going to be impeached eventually. Well, I have fact-checked so many of these things that they have brought out or stated over the last year. And, you know, a lot of this stuff has just turned to dust There's really not much there. And often there would be exaggerations. So they tried to make a big deal about the fact that Hunter Biden had LLCs, you know, and they made it seem like they would call them, you know, shell companies. Like limited liability corporations. Right. Mm -hmm. And they called them shell companies. But I looked into all these, you know, quote unquote shell companies and they all had legitimate business interests and conducted real business. and. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's one example. And then, of course, the most famous example is they made a big deal about this FBI informant that supposedly had claimed that there was a $5 million bribe each to Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. And then that guy got indicted for lying to um, the FBI. So that kind of blew up in their face. Mm -hmm. So it's been really difficult for them to find that any particular crimes were committed. Now, Hunter Biden is going to go on trial this year for having to do with his taxes as well as a gun charge. So he will go on trial. So it's like, what additional referral are you going to make to the Justice Department regarding Hunter Biden, let Mm -hmm. alone Joe Biden? And I should note that, you know, of course, you can't bring any criminal prosecution against the president under Justice Department guidelines. A sitting president. A sitting Mm -hmm. president. Mm -hmm. A sitting president, yeah. So any referral would have to be taken up by a Trump Justice Department if Trump won. It's a whole other can of worms. (laughs) This hearing really felt like something of a death knell for the impeachment inquiry. You had Republicans talking about criminal referrals rather than actually impeaching. And you also had some Democrats basically daring Republicans to press forward with this and hold a vote on this, uh, effectively knowing that they don't have that support. And Congressman Eric Swalwell at one point ran down a top 10 list of signs that the impeachment inquiry was effectively dying. And I think we have that clip here. Number 10, your key witness today is testifying from the slammer. Number nine, key evidence of a bribe that you all relied on. The guy who said that has been indicted for lying about that bribe, and he's a Russian asset. Number eight, another key witness has been indicted as a Chinese agent. That clip from Swalwell, I think, kind of epitomized the Democrats' posture towards this, which was basically, look at how badly this is going for you guys. I can't believe you're still doing these things. You know, The House Republicans have a very narrow House majority, so they can't lose a lot of votes on anything, and that's been a problem for them. Right. But in this case, it's not just a matter of two or three House Republicans that probably wouldn't vote to impeach right now. There are a large number of them that are on record saying that they haven't seen high crimes and misdemeanors here, that this inquiry basically hasn't connected the dots in any way that's sufficient to go to this historic step. And so— I think there was an expectation when Republicans launched into this process that it was kind of a fait accompli, that there would be an impeachment eventually. And the fact that it's not going to wind up being that way, at least all indications right now are that's the case, that's a pretty remarkable, I think, misstep from a House Republican conference that hasn't exactly had a very good year plus in the majority here. Right. They actually, remember, it took them two tries to impeach Mayorkas. Yeah. Who is the uh, secretary of the Homeland Security Department. Right. Mm-hmm. And they haven't even sent those articles over to the Senate yet. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, because if you were to look at this as a basically a political exercise, the fact that they can't get enough people, enough Republicans 
if they were to put on the House floor to vote in the affirmative, if you put that up against Joe Biden's popularity, I mean, he's not a particularly popular president at the moment. That's a far cry from, oh, the president is very popular to voting to impeach him. Right. And actually, in some ways, Biden's unpopularity makes it less of an imperative for the Republicans to impeach him. Oh, interesting. Right. So they don't really necessarily need impeachment to take Joe Biden down a few rungs because right. he's already done that himself. And so before we wrap up, what else should we be thinking about heading into the next week? Yeah, I think a really big question next week is going to be what happens with the Manhattan case uh, against Trump. There's been a dispute over evidence that wasn't turned over to Trump's lawyers, uh, allegedly uh, some malfeasance with that. And there's going to be a hearing on Monday. Um, the the trial date is in flux. They hope to have it in in, in starting in April. Uh, but there are some real questions here. And, and given that this is the one trial that looks like it's it was definitely going to happen this year, uh, with the other ones, maybe not so much. I think a lot of people should be paying attention to the kind of the inner workings of what happens next week, starting with that hearing on Monday. That's it for today's episode. I want to thank you, Glenn, so much for joining us. And thank you, Aaron, as well. You're welcome. Thank you. Glenn Kessler runs the Fact Checker for The Post. And Aaron Blake is a senior political reporter and author of the Campaign Moment newsletter. And you can find a link to the Campaign Moment newsletter in our show notes at postreports.com. Before we go, there's one other thing we're paying attention to in the coming days. Trump has until Monday to pay a $454 million bond in his New York civil fraud case. His lawyers have argued that he can't get financing for the appeal bond. If he can't get it together in time, the New York Attorney General's office could start seizing his assets, like Trump Tower in New York City. Filing for bankruptcy could get him out of this jam. But our colleagues report that Trump is not considering that, because it would damage his image as a successful businessman as he runs for president. We'll get into all that and more next week. That's it for Post Reports. Thanks for listening. Today's show was produced and mixed by Ted Muldoon. It was edited by Renata Jablonski. Our team also includes Maggie Penman, Rena Flores, Lucy Perkins, Monica Campbell, Alana Gordon, Ariel Plotnick, Bishop Sand, Renny Svernovsky, Sabi Robinson, Emma Talkoff, Sean Carter, Peter Bresnan, Allison Michaels, and Martine Powers. I'm Elahe Izadi. We'll be back on Monday with more stories from The Washington Post. Glenn, there's a question I've had for you for a very long time that I've been dying to ask you, even before I've met you, uh, which is, what is the craziest lie that you've ever uncovered? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, uh, you know, I've written several thousand fact checks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and there have been some crazy ones. But, you know, at the moment, the, the former president of the United States is on my mind. There's one lie he said when he was president, which befuddled me completely. Uh -huh. And he not only said it once or twice, but he actually said it four times. And that was that Barack Obama was so hated by the Philippines that they refused to let his plane land when he went for there for a state visit. That's so specific. Yes, and he even would he when he would talk about it, he would even use his hands like he'd like a little airplane, so okay. swirling <laughs> around, and it is just so crazy. I could never begin to figure out where this even or how this even entered into Trump's mind. His staff would never <laughs> explain it, and I ended up writing something like, "Why would he say something that was so ridiculously false?" And the the answer may simply because. He could. <laughs>